Oh, it's working? Cool. Thank you, Ren. All right. Uh, my name is Mike Schutte. I'm here to show you very little code, but tell you a whole lot about how I think you should write it and the processes you should kind of adopt mentally in, in your workflow. Uh, I appreciate you all coming out. I know it's late in the week. Uh, it's, but we've learned a lot of like really cool technical topics and different uh, mental frameworks, and it's been super stimulating. So I know physically, mentally, it's a lot. So I appreciate you coming out, even if most of you are here because there was overflow from the sexier webpacker topics. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and go over the general scope of what we're going to cover today. Um, I'm going to go pretty like unusually long into my background, but I promise there's a purpose for that. And then we're going to get kind of normed on our goals for today. I liked the previous talk talking about the victory conditions, so we're going to take a second to kind of make sure that we're clear on that. Then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, testing paradigms and kind of the different ways we can go about testing and uh, how uh, what I mean by a paradigm in this case. And then we're going to dive deep into uh, the point of this whole talk, which is how to think of testing as more of a storytelling process and not just an obligation that you have or a potential dopamine hit from a green suite. And then we're going to do an experimental demo. Uh, I'm going to be looking for some help on that and just to walk through a potential uh, actual process of applying product requirements or uh, different specs into a story. That, that could then be used to implement some actual uh, functionality. And then we will uh, kind of review what we cover, make sure we're walking away with at least one uh, substantive kind of piece of information that will uh, influence us going into the next weeks and months of our work. And we'll be on our way, waiting for the awesome tender love closing keynote. Cool. So we have 5, 1, 4, 20, 8, 2. And I was going to try to show off some like fancy proc syntax with Ruby, but then I remembered that it's Ruby, and you can just call dot sum. <laughs> so it's like, thank you, Matt. So uh, I currently live in Detroit. I work for a company called Quickly. It's a digital marketing platform where we get to use a uh, really beautifully written Rails core. We have some React front end, uh, some Go services for our high traffic endpoints. Really interesting challenges that we get to solve. Um, my favorite one is. We have basically hundreds of thousands of users hitting one endpoint in a matter of five minutes. And that's like really interesting, uh, sometimes over my head in terms of how we handle that. Uh, how I got into coding, I studied environmental science in undergrad. And then with the environmental issues, I started becoming more and more interested in the social issues. So I ended up tacking on a sociology major. And I, that led me to serving for a year as a city year core member, which is like a volunteer AmeriCorps program. And I, Worked with fifth graders in a classroom for a year, and that was really uh, an incredible experience. A lot, of, a lot of highs, a lot of lows. That led me to have more of an interest in structural systems, like how do we end up with education inequality? What are the societal factors that lead to some students having iPads for every student in the room and other students with 20-year-old textbooks, right? What are the structural conditions that lead to that? Quickly found out that I cared a lot more about telling people about sociology because I went to grad school. I was in this PhD program. I was going to be a professor. And then all, I found myself just running regressions on big data models. And uh, I missed the, the kind of fire that the, the theory and like the awareness that the, the actual kind of more qualitative stuff brought me. So decided to move back to Denver. I had moved to Indiana, came back to Denver, where it was my, my home at the time. And I was just about to get a job at a coffee shop and start writing about education and start maybe pursuing music, just doing the whole gig economy. I had my Lyft certification, everything taken care of. And my partner, Hannah, had heard of a boot, a boot camp in Denver called Turing. And she wanted to go and get, get some feelers on what it was like. She was interested in some basic comprehension of HTML, CSS, front end type technologies. I came along for moral support. and. Five minutes in, we found out that Turing was looking for 70 hours a week and seven months and full-time commitment. And Hannah, who had a great job, uh, quickly became very uninterested. And all of a sudden, with no programming experience and for no reason other than curiosity, I was super intrigued. Uh, one thing led to another. And all of a sudden, I started caring about lining up my equal signs and having skinny controllers and starting to think of equal signs as assignment operators altogether. So the, the whole nerd life was uh, a pretty robust transition for me. Then uh, I was still able to kind of pursue my loves for long distance running. 
and writing music, uh, piano and guitar and singing, all these things that exercise different parts of the brain. And I love reading fiction and writing poetry. All right. And I warned you, but then of course you're like, why is this guy trying to tell me so much about his life? I want to learn how to test. I want to learn how to write better tests, right? So um, there's a reason for that, right? I gave you a bunch of context for me, and context is super important. It's kind of a critical component uh, for the way I'm going to frame storytelling and how it can help you write better tests. So keep context in mind. Goals for you. This is how I'm going to frame my success, and it's one of those things, like as a teacher, it's just I will never know if it really worked, unless you tweet at me, at Team Mike Shu, uh, where you can also get the slides. That was another, the, my most recent tweet, you can get the slides for these if you want to follow along. So my goals for you, the, way, the things I want you to keep in mind, if, if you start to disagree with something or you start to get confused by something, just kind of try to reorient yourself and use these goals as kind of a compass. Like, am I, am I on this track? Am I either getting more perspective, either enriched or newfound perspective on what it means to test, why we test, how can I test? And also a newfound or, again, like uh, re uh, reinforced or um, newly, newly founded sense of confidence in your ability to write tests. So I know uh, from experience that some people don't end up writing tests because they don't know how to test. They don't feel like they know how to test the right things. And this is silly because uh, in a lot of ways there, you have some innate human capacity to write really expressive and uh, like very robust tests that will help you write better software. Cool. So when we talk about testing, it could mean a lot of different things. And if you're interested in that, that like daily vocabulary buildup, just in case, if you haven't run across the adjective form of paradigm, we can, we can all of a sudden pronounce the G hardly and say paradigmatic. And in this sense, I'm just talking about that testing is paradigmatic because uh, it is kind of surrounded by uh, the certain assumptions that we use and agreed upon methodologies for figuring out how to do it. And these core assumptions and methodologies lead to drastically different outcomes, right? So a lot of what we're talking about is going to have like subtle and like nuanced differences. Um, but it's kind of like when, when you have an angle, the, the origin can be quite similar. But as it goes out, the consequences and the outputs are like very different. So. That's kind of something to keep in mind is, is that the way we think about actually doing this thing can, have, can make a really big difference. Cool. So uh, one testing paradigm is test last. And uh, it's basically what it sounds like. You have uh, somewhat functioning code. You've implemented a program or full-on application. And then uh, you remember you're in the Rails community. You're like, I should have some tests. So you write a bunch of tests. Hopefully they pass. That was probably a very hard process to write tests for existing software. And then you have a green test suite. And this is, you know, it's better than nothing, I suppose. Um, but it has some, like, some hidden uh, caution, uh, some dangers, I guess, within there. Because you might have bugs embedded in your implementation. Uh, and you have kind of false assurance that a green test is saying, hey, it's all good. But all you have in, is an existing implementation. You've designed a test to fit that implementation, which is similar, uh, like a circular definition by saying blue is blue because it's blue, which is uh, a bit puzzling when you think about it. So test last has kind of been one extreme camp where you just kind of tack it on at the end and wipe your hands, call it a day. When we step over the main boundary line to a more uh, test first or test driven paradigm, we benefit from this great design principle of red green refactor, which means we write the test and we're in the red because we haven't written any codes. We are, we're automatically failing. I've basically told a story to my test suite or my interpreters describing certain functionality, be it a, the smallest feature or the biggest function. And the computer hears this story, and it's like, yeah, but it's not, it's not really happening. Like You're saying this is the case, but it's, I don't see it. So you get failures, and in Rails, that whole process is just incredible, right? You, it's like holding your hand down the path for most basic CRUD functionality, things like that. So then you finally, you walk through those errors, you get a passing implementation. Then you're free to refactor, right? The idea is to just follow along, like address one error at a time, stay focused, use that test as kind of a guide to, to get to your overall goal. At that point, once you have a passing test, you can refactor. Oftentimes, those refactors will break the, the solution. You'll have a failing test. You implement it again to get green, and you have this like kind of hardening phase. I think of it like a heading inward on a spiral until you find like the one that you're really happy with, the one you'd be 
uh, happy to pull a, open a PR on. So test first uh, is a bit misleading because it's more similar to test last, in my opinion, than uh, to test driven because the, this process, again, is like very nuanced, but you're saying, okay, I have this uh, requirement and I pretty much know how I'm gonna do this. Okay, so how would I do this? I'm gonna write the test with this solution in mind. And I actually found a lot more clarity on, like, on the difference, uh, thanks to these ideas introduced at this conference, like conceptual compression, where you know, we want to like, kind of compress ideas and store them in like, smaller parts or in parts of our brain that we can kind of dig into when we need, but otherwise clear up space in our heads. And with a test first philosophy, you might be writing the test file first, but you're clouding your, your brain with the implementation details. And so just like good object-oriented programming, we want to not be doing multiple jobs at once, right? So test first is basically writing a test with the implementation in mind. And this limits you from the like, really nice benefits of test-driven design. So test first, this is like taking the leap to, uh, hey, I'm totally ignorant to how I'm gonna implement this. I know that I basically, I have this input or I have this user action and I want it to result or return in some uh, side effect or some value. And what's really beautiful about this is it frees you up to just think more like a user, right? When this thing happens, what, what should be like, like the grand side effect or the grand return? Uh, and all of a sudden you're thinking more about what makes sense and what feels good and not just does it work. Um, so that's test driven. And behavior driven is this kind of like higher, higher conceptual level where we're not just thinking about does the code work, but is it valuable? Like is the code we're writing, like what value does it provide the business or the organization? And so I, I almost fall back on this as uh, the difference between um, testing to an interface versus an implementation. There was at the um, Derek Pryor talk on migrations, there's a great admission of like, Gang of Four, the book that I always quote but have never actually fully read. Um, so this idea that we can uh, program to an interface but not an implementation, to me is how I kind of think of the difference between test driven, you're just saying like, hey, this function uh, takes some user model count from zero to one, versus like, no, like, if a, if a user creates an account, um, the user count is just incremented by one, like it changes by one, right? And frameworks like RSpec give us a much more expressive way to describe system changes and not implementation details, which would be, okay, it starts at zero and ends at one. Well, that's a really, that's a one-time use case, right? Where the database count is zero and the, the, it ends up at one. So we, it's again, it's subtle, but we want to get in this mindset of what's the overall functionality? Why is it valuable? And uh, how, can it, how can we write our tests to, or our code to satisfy these tests? Cool. So I told you to stop testing and start storytelling, but I've just been talking about testing. So I'm sure it's obvious that I really do want you to keep testing. I just want you to think about it differently, right? I want you to think about it as a design tool and as a, an, an empathetic tool that helps you constantly remind yourself of users and what it means to be writing software. Um, it's, absolutely critical that we remember that software is always means to an end, always. Like no matter how fun uh, writing in Ruby is and writing tests and the workflow and it's fun to get good at keyboard shortcuts and all this stuff, uh, I love that too. But at the end of the day, if people, if it doesn't make sense to people and they don't feel good and they don't feel confident and they don't feel empowered by the stuff we're making, um, it doesn't matter. So the whole point of this is to uh, exercise more parts of our human brains that make us think more like users and have more empathy, right? Because the code you write is gonna influence someone's emotions, right? No matter, even if it's a database migration, right? Like, this is gonna have a cascading effect on the API that we can work with within the app, and that's eventually gonna end up, you know, whether it's an API or, you know, full-on, full-stack app, people are gonna interact with the code that you've written in some way and feel good or bad about it. So that's like, that's like such a responsibility for us to have and so the, the more that our storytelling and our testing process represents the user and we're kind of writing code on behalf of the user, uh, the better software we're gonna write. So from function to feature, I'll keep kind of using that term, like it doesn't matter even if it's just this little helper that you're working on. Um, every little algorithm you've written for an app that ends up being used by a user, that matters, right? So it doesn't matter the scope of what you're working on. Thinking of the user um, is, totally paramount to everything we do. 
So I'm breaking this down into uh, four main topics uh, in terms of what is, how is storytelling similar to writing code and writing software, and how can it help us. I'm going to uh, deviate from these minute expectations um, because they're, they're fun and they're just, yeah, these, I try to hold to them, but forgive me if I go over. So we have communication, context, abstraction, and encapsulation. And it's like, wow, those last two are object-oriented principles. And it's like, yeah, it's going to help us. <laughs> so we're going to like wed these things. We've learned to be good programmers, and uh, we already have these existing storyteller um, and like communicative skills that we have as humans by default. So that's really great. Um, in a lot of ways, we're like our own Rails framework, where we just have a bunch of stuff for free. So uh, when I think of communication, uh, like right now, I'm commun communicating to you. It's pretty one way. Thank you for participating. Uh, I'm trying to get an idea that's in my head into your head and try to establish some semblance of agreement on what that idea is, right? And if it goes well, you know, y'all like subtweet me or whatever, then the idea that I had I can tell is like out in the world and that's comfortable for me, right? Like not even comfortable, but it feels nice. So. When the opposite happens and I have an expectation in my head that doesn't become real, that feels really bad. We've all had maybe um, travel troubles, coming to conferences, things like that. Uh, you're at the airport ticket gate and your flight's canceled. The agent's telling you there's nothing, nothing that can be done. And in your head, you're like, but I'm, I'm like a beautiful butterfly. I'm unique and this is my life that's impacted. Can't you, can't you like do something for me? And they're looking at you like, I have 100 people in the same boat, right? So, what you have is just a conflict, uh, or a, you, you have disagreement of ideas and heads, right? Like, the person who is the airport user is saying, I should be treated specially, I should have a solution provided, and that's not being met, right? So that, that feels bad. So communication is about, good communication is about f uh, finding shared agreement on what, we're ex on what we're expecting to happen. So in that sense, users are communicating with software, right? You open your app, you have expectations about when you click this button or go to this link, I expect certain things to happen. And when we have buggy software that, that has unexpected behavior, that's confusing because the world as the user knows it becomes less predictable and that feels really shitty. So how do we imbue this whole, this entire philosophy of thinking about communication uh, as this like agreement of ideas and providing predictability and comfort? Uh, we have to think of it as the software we write is ultimately a listener. It's listening to what the user does. And so we want to, uh, when we're writing tests, we're basically describing, hey, the user's gonna, I would wanna do this as a user. Uh, this is what the user's gonna do. So I need you to listen to this behavior and do these things when it happens, right? So when we remove ourselves from the nitty gritty implementation details that require a lot more uh, mental horsepower and we can just say, hey, how should this flow? Like what makes sense? We're really representing our users and we're gonna end up writing more intuitive, uh, cleaner software, both on the internals, right, for our future developers, fellow collaborators, and for the end users that uh, end up using the, the finished product. So the next bit is context. Uh, I mentioned, I was like, wow, this guy's talking for five minutes about himself at a technical talk. Um, with each bit of information, you learned a little bit more about me, and uh, everything, henceforth becomes a little bit more predictable, right? So it's nice to get to know people because your surroundings become more familiar. Um, there might be a case where, I don't know, we, I'm at the bus station later today and we run into each other and you're like, oh, like I know these things about it. Like your environment all of a sudden becomes more familiar, more predictable, and more comfortable. Context essentially provides uh, awareness about how causes and effects are related to each other and how systems work overall. And for whatever reason, like I have not dived into the like academic psychology of why this makes us feel comfortable, but there's something about stability and order and um, just having things like uh, unfold as we expect that makes us feel good. So context helps us kind of zoom out and see, oh, so if this happens, then that'll happen. And because he's from Denver, he probably likes the mountains, right? So it allows you to uh, create um, reliable predictions about how the world is, and we like this. So context brings more understanding, right? Just the more that you can see the, the system that you're looking at or the relationship between causes and effects, 
that's going to make you understand um, how future manipulations to the system, um, what types of consequences those will have. With more understanding, it gives you more predictive power. You just, you basically have a bigger data set to rely upon to um, handle ambiguity. Okay, well, um, I've seen a whole lot of similar things like this, so like, even though I haven't seen this exact case before, I, I, I can reasonably expect a certain output. And I'm speaking in very abstract terms because um, it's, it's something we do all the time, so I encourage you to think about as you navigate new situations, meeting new people, being in new cities, like what are the mental processes you're going through um, to feel better and feel more at home? So more predictive power makes, gives you more confident decision making, right? Uh, if I can more easily uh, anticipate changes to system and be like, okay, I really know what's going on here. Like I know everyone in the room, I know where the restaurants are. Um, okay, I know that there are a ton of good restaurants on this street, so I feel confident in uh, choosing a place for dinner for the whole group that's not going to be terrible and give me a bad reputation for picking terrible restaurants. That happened to me yesterday. Um, and with more confident decision making, that's like kind of a no-brainer. It just feels good, right? I, it's, it's great to feel confident. Uh, I think of that, the, the idea of building software to make your users feel like a badass, right? I'm forgetting the, off, off, the author off the top of my head, but look into um, the, the idea of making your users feel like badasses, feeling empowered, feeling like they are competent and good at stuff. This is really important. So all of this is to say, uh, when we can tell stories about our software, we will write better software. So I told you about how when I'm telling you about my life, you have more context for who I am. When you as a developer take the time to zoom out and just think about, okay, what, what am I really trying to uh, affect here in the code base? What am I really trying to implement? You're automatically moving yourself into a space that's contextual within the app, not just adding a new feature, but how does this feature relate to other features? Or how does this function relate to other functions? And you're, you're occupying a mental space that's going to be much more aware of how these systems interrelate and, how, and what might introduce new bugs. And uh, do, like, does the overall implementation make sense? Like, should users be able to do X if Y is um, like true or what? You know, you can recognize these relationships with a lot more ease and intuition, as opposed to when you're deep in uh, writing a reduce function, right? Like you're getting lost on which one's the accumulator and which, one, you know, whatever. So context, as a developer, you can find more context when you take this storytelling mindset when you're writing your tests, because you're paying attention to how, do, how, do the, how does this individual part, this uh, method or feature under test that I'm looking at, how does it relate to other things, and how does it ultimately make sense to users? So we have communication, we have context, and now we're getting into um, the, the interesting bit of saying, well, yeah, abstraction and encapsulation, those are principles of object-oriented programming. They're also principles of uh, how we go throughout day-to-day -day life, right? These are principles, I would say, of storytelling as well. So we're going to go through some, some uh, built-in Rails magic that our bodies have. You touch a stove. Right? You say, oh, that's hot. Let me uh, send a little worker job up to my brain. Signal, like, hey, we have some heat on the hand. Send back down some instructions on how to move my fingers and then do like a oh shit method, right? Uh, no, right? We have these like automatic processes that uh, produce some change in state, some change in output, some side effect. That's really cool, right? We take advantage of abstractions all the time. So um, while they, uh, seem intimidating sometimes, and this is a word that's come up a lot, right? Like, should we lean on abstractions? Should we dig into them? Should we understand everything? Um, I think there's a lot of proof in the pudding that we, the things that we are able to do are enabled by abstractions, right? Like, if I had to worry about uh, how to actually implement movement and not just think of movement and have movement, then I wouldn't be able to do very much. So that's a case where abstraction really does open you up to do um, more uh, advanced or innovative things. Breathing is another one. I have some agreement, some internal contract where I'm agreeing to stay on this interval, and if I interfere with that public API of continuous breathing, there's going to be some like undefined errors going on, and people are like the collaborating objects are going to be freaking out. So that's another thing, right? Breathing. It's abstracted away. We don't know the implementation details. We figured them out because we're we're humans and we love figuring stuff out. But I don't have to know how. I just need to. Um, interface well with the API of breathing. Muscle memory. If you type on your computer most days, you 
probably get better at typing. You may not even have to look anymore. Uh, this allows you to just think of words and have them on the screen. You don't have to look down. Where's the back tick? Okay, that one, that one took me a while to learn back ticks. And all of a sudden, they're just appearing on the screen. And so there's one hurdle removed between the program you want to write or the test you want to write and the reality that's represented on the screen. Muscle memory, another great example of abstraction that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis that enables us to do more complex tasks with ease. Also, literally every spoken, written, body language ever is abstraction, right? Everything I'm doing and saying and representing as symbols up on the screen, they don't have inherent meaning. We've learned to associate them with real world objects or I other abstract ideas, and we are able to uh, leverage abstractions to communicate more complex or bigger topics by compressing them. Like a word is a great example of conceptual compression, right? I can refer to a stove and not have to explain to you what a stove is, how it's used, what are the parts, right? We just have these abstractions and th that are made up of sounds and visuals that help us uh, have a, like a shared agreement on what I'm talking about, shared understanding. So abstraction is awesome. You are good at it. Super good at it, like probably one of the best in the, uh, on Earth. There might be better in the great beyond, but uh, this is something that like, you can really recognize in your everyday life, and it's something that, again, the whole point of it is to enable us to um, do more advanced tasks, um, be able to think more clearly, and uh, kind of compartmentalize different jobs that we have as programmers, which brings us into encapsulation. We have these principles that guide how we write code, and sometimes I think we forget to actually apply those to our own thought processes, right? Um, when a class has too many jobs, we call that a code sniff, right? When a person has too many jobs, we kind of, well, in some cases, we glorify it, right? Like, there's kind of, the kind, of, kind of a double standard, and so if we find peace and happiness and single responsibility in our code, and you know, I know that doesn't hold water all the way through, but uh, I think there is something to be learned from uh, the fact that c uh, when we're programming, uh, we, are cons we are constraining our imagination, we're constraining our clarity of thought, because we're limited by the constructs of the language we're working in. Um, if you, whenever you're talking to someone about software, it's a lot easier, especially, you know, and it, like product people, or I'm showing my mom some app, and she's like, oh, it'd be cool if you could do this. She's not worried about if it's possible. Right? She just has, she has an idea and she's like, I think you know, if you could click here, then this would show up. And so we think of a lot better ideas. We think in more fluid ways when we're not trying to think of as both programmer and user. So maybe we should separate those more clearly, separate concerns temporarily, right? We have, we're not a literal class. We can be dynamic, but I can maybe put my programmer hat on when I need to implement code and I can put on my user, my storyteller hat on when I need to describe how the software should work. Cool. When you are writing tests, you should think about, once I get into implementing and I get really stuck on something, I don't know how I'm going to do this yet, I'm going to get confused by some third party documentation or how a method works or um, how to like, instantiate a job instance. Think about your tests is where you're going to come back to kind of reorient your compass back home. You have some ultimate goal and more often than not, you're going to run into some snags, and one great way to keep that story, like keep that whole big picture in mind of like your whole purpose about what you're working on, is to have a really uh, expressive and like kind of human, uh, human story-oriented um, compass that can help you get back on track. Because I don't know about you, but oftentimes when I get deep into a bug at the end of the day, I just want to go home, but I feel bad because I'm like, wait, what did I just get stuck on? Okay, I got stuck on this. What, what was I ultimately trying to do? And then I can keep zooming out and I try to remind myself, okay, and that's gonna let users you know, log in easier with SMS. Like, okay, that's, that was time well spent. It felt like mental spaghetti, but I'm feeling, I'll get it tomorrow, and that's okay. So all of this kind of led me to, as I was preparing this talk, this kind of like meta fractal alert. And this is, I love programming because I think there's so many lessons we can learn about how we think, because it's ultimately like structured decision making that lead to outputs. So programs solve problems, right? In general, programs solve problems. I think that's mostly a fact. Or they make more problems, but they're involved, they're involved in problem solving. Uh, the process of writing programs 
is a problem solving process. So we, our problem as developers is to write things, make things that solve problems. So we're problem solving to make problem solvers. So it's like, whoa, inception. The streets are folding in on themselves. So this is all to say that like, hey, if these principles help us write better programs, maybe those same principles we can use on our own process to be better programmers, right? So just by approaching our process with more discipline and more uh, intention, separating concerns, I, when I'm writing a test, I should be basically separating the logic and the data from just like how should it work, right? So my implementation is what's gonna actually make it so, but I can occupy this, this responsibility of just describing how the software works um, when I'm writing my test. Cool. So to wrap up all that, uh, Uncle Walt Whitman would say that we contain multitudes, right? Like there are so many uh, perspectives and thoughts and, and uh, opinions and expectations that we represent uh, at any given time. And two of those that are most important in our day-to-day -day work is the two hats of user and programmer, right? So when you are implementing code, you're thinking like a programmer, and you're not really thinking about how, is, how does this filter function or how does this uh, active record relation really affect my user. And that's okay. I don't think you should be thinking about the user when you're implementing code. I think you should be thinking about the user in your testing suite. And this is why I think it's, it's, so, it's a design issue. It's not about having that dopamine hit and that sense of like, uh, you know, clap for me, pat on the back for being a good Rails developer. It, it really influences the way that you write software. Um, so if we start with tests and we think about users, it's going to influence how we design our ultimate programs. Cool. So here is the, the experiment. I'm going to ask for your help. We're going to take like five minutes, basically, to um, take a crowdsource. Like someone has an issue for a feature or a function coming up. So I'm asking for a brave volunteer to uh, just kind of shout out or like raise your hand and then I'll try to just like do a demo, kind of pseudo-coding our spec to say like, hey, let's take that idea, let's turn it into a test uh, or something that looks like a test and just to like keep that user in mind. So please, any, any takers, upcoming issue, upcoming functions, so, like first thing you have to do after this talk or when you get back to work. I knew this might happen. That's why it's an experiment. Okay. This was, a, this was a funny issue for me because I thought about having pre-made code um, but the whole point is that uh, I didn't want to um, have existing code because then I already have the implementation in mind, right? Like I wanted it to be live. So uh, in the absence of the volunteered idea, which I no, <laughs> no judgment, I totally understand. Uh, maybe I could have tweeted about it to like bring an idea. Um, I just encourage you to like the next time when you get an issue, when you get back to work, just ask yourself, okay, like how does this request fit into the larger context of my application? Why is this worth building? You might even find that like, this actually doesn't sound that useful. Has this been verified? Like, we have, like who wants this? And it's like some pet project that some uh, marketer has. And you're like, OK, well, love the work you do, but I don't know if this really makes sense in our context, right? So that's my, we're turning the demo to a call to action. All right, so what do we talk about? Uh, we talked about how testing is paradigmatic in the sense that it's governed by some kind of agreed upon principles. Uh, that lead to accepted or unaccepted methodologies for discovering new ideas, and that uh, by choosing different paradigms, we talked about test last, test first, test driven, and then ultimately behavior driven, uh, these things will influence our end results, right? So by choosing and agreeing upon the way that we're gonna think about the process and the intent of these um, systems, uh, this system in this case would be the, the process of writing tests for software, um, the way that we agree upon doing that is going to directly affect the end result. Communication uh, in the context of writing tests and telling stories is about building good listeners, turning our software into good listeners, thinking about what the user is most likely, go uh, most likely going to be expecting. Um, and in best cases, we've maybe done some market research, we've interviewed users, and we know what they're expecting. And we want to build software that listens well and says, hey, I hear you, I see you, I know what, I know what you want from me, and here you go. Here's this like, great load. Here's this really intuitive uh, photo interface, whatever you're working on. 
The other thing that storytelling and that, that hat that you can wear uh, gives you is just more context, which when you're writing a test, you're going to be thinking more about um, the integration of the function to the feature and how it uh, collaborates with other parts of your app. And you're going to feel better about um, implementing new stuff because you're viewing it from a further distance and you're thinking about how uh, manipulations to the system will make certain consequences and, and result in different outcomes. So you're going to feel better because uh, you are thinking about the broader view and not just focusing in isolation on one bit and then being like, okay, this bit works. I don't really know if anything else is going to break because there's no uh, other tests. I'm just going to ship it. So starting with tests is going to put you in a different headspace to think holistically, to think about the flow of an application. And again, that software is always means to an end to help users. We talked about abstraction. You're super good at it. Uh, you, total, you are enabled to do great things by a ton of abstractions uh, that you, well, we talk mostly about physical examples, but even like language. Um, these things enable us to do more advanced things, and the more that we can build abstractions that, are, that hold water and are super good and super solid, then we can do more interesting things. And then lastly, we talked about encapsulation and how applying the same discipline that we might to our code could introduce a much cleaner, uh, more disciplined process that leads to better software. So, and I don't think it's limited to abstraction and encapsulation, right? The next time you're reading an article about a design pattern or uh, some type of solution to an interesting technical problem, try to like zoom out and be like, what is this ultimately doing? Um, and could, could I apply that to my workflow? Like, is there is there some common knowledge that that would make sense there? It's not it's not always going to be there, but I think it's something worth noting that since programs solve problems and we write programs, then the principles that we use to guide good software might help us with a better process. Ultimately, the whole point that I really care about this issue and the thing I want you to keep in mind is that thinking of testing as this kind of separate domain of headspace, it keeps you closer to, you, to, to your users because you're thinking about how is this ultimately used and why is it valuable and does it make sense. So the action plan is to develop kind of a pendulum workflow where you write the test, right? But we still have to eventually write some code that works. And so uh, it's just getting into that rhythm of describing what you should be working on, what should ultimately be the output of your effort, getting into it, putting in the effort, producing the thing, building the thing. That's why we love this job, is to put something out in the world. Uh, but always be conscious of coming back to it, right? Does this make sense? OK, cool. Let me come back. I've got a little lost. Am I still on the right track? Cool. Come back. We don't want to do like the really long uh, wavelength between the two, right? Where it's like, well, I'm just going to like write a big test, and then I'm going to implement a whole bunch of features and just kind of rely on that one test. Like, always come back to it, even if tests are passing. Always remind yourself, uh, what was the whole point of this? So I hope that uh, you're walking away with a sense of confidence, excitement, perspective on testing. Uh, it's, it can really be kind of a holistic uh, kind of paradigm shift on how you write code. It certainly has for me. And yeah, I hope you feel uh, empowered and excited to come back to work either tomorrow, later today, next week, and keep your users in mind and tell great stories about your software. Thank you.